So the talk I would like to give today is on the topic of my PhD, which is a new three-axis automated stepwise thermomagnetometer system, which I have named Smarter. So a bit about me. Um, I started off as a mechanical engineer, and then I got turned into a paleomagnetist twice, once when I was in undergrad, because I worked with uh, Professor Joe Kirschfink to create a in situ field magnetometer system, which we then used to study um, figurines in Guatemala, which apparently you can tell the apparent sex of the figurine heads by looking at where they have a lightning strike. Simultaneously to this, in 2015, I started a master's degree also at Caltech, where my specialization was in paleomagnetism. Then when I was applying for PhDs, I decided to combine the two and became a paleomagnetic engineer, in effect. My thesis is prototyping the next generation of versatile paleomagnetic laboratory. I finished that in September of 2020. And one of the main results from that is the new automated magnetometer system that I'll be talking about today. So in a normal paleomagnetic laboratory, you have a few options for what type of equipment you want to use. And you have a very cheap, very robust, but also very work intensive option of the JR6 spinner magnetometer. This is a extremely good piece of equipment. Um, if for example, a lab is shut down for seven months due to unforeseen circumstances, and then you want to reopen the lab, the first thing that will work is the spinner magnetometer. To go with that, you also need a way to get either um, a thermal demagnetization or an AF demagnetization. And so you then need a separate piece of equipment to actually demagnetize it to then measure everything on the spinner magnetometer. For scale on these two pictures, the squares that are made by the cages are two feet um, on each side or 60 centimeters. There's another option. It is faster um, and sensitive, but much more expensive. And this is the rapid system. This is a picture of the one we currently have here. For scaling purposes, it's the same uh, 60 centimeter squares. And the sample changer lets you use up to 99 specimens at a time that will then be automatically measured, um, which is extremely helpful. It means that, for example, you can give a presentation at magnetic interactions while something is running on the other side of the lab. And OK, so that's great. Still very large. And there's um, another option to go with that, where if you want to avoid having to pay much attention to it, you can run each sample individually in situ. And in the case of the rapid, this is done with an AF demagnetization coil, which is built in. This is extremely helpful because it means that you can get an entire paleo direction by clicking go and never having to come back. And the other option is used pretty much exclusively by the University of Liverpool Laboratory. And it's the Tristan microwave system. Uh, this is a stock photo because the system is currently down for maintenance. But the idea with this one is you can get one paleo intensity estimate at a time. So you can fine tune the data um, and the experimental procedures after you get each data point. So then the question is, we have these two ways of doing it. We have a good system to get alternating field demagnetizations quickly. We have a good way to do paleo intensities, um, 
with the very specialized microwave equipment. But then the question that comes after that is, can we take the best parts of each of these and turn them into something new? So in order to do this, we need to then get um, a temperature range that will cover most magnetic minerals, so at least 600 degrees in order to get uh, magnetite, or um, 700 degrees if you want to also get hematite. Then there are um, another requirement that we need our three axis full vector uh, measurements. Both paleo direction and paleo intensity data would be best. A goal is for it to be solid state. So there's no movement while measuring. Um, one goal would also be no movement while heating or measuring to do the same in the same place. Uh, this one does not do that. We wanted specifically to see if we could do this using high sensitivity squid sensors. And most importantly, we wanted a more moderate cost. Uh, there is no way we're going to be able to get this as cheap as a um, JR6 spinner, but we're trying to get something that isn't quite as expensive as a rapid system. So this is the very prototype design. It has um, an automated control system. It can give you a thermal demagnetization and give you a paleo direction in about 30 minutes using 30 degree temperature steps. It will give you full vector three axis magnetic data. And you will notice that all the parts used are non-magnetic, such as the aluminum RF shielding or the wooden quad pod. Um, and the immune metal shield, of course, is extremely magnetic on the flip side as our primary source of shielding. The control system for it is relatively straightforward. The temperatures are input or calculated as the case may be. It gives an output file that outputs squid voltages. And it can be run in different modes depending on how many squids are installed. In mine, I have two installed, but you can have up to three um, as a function of the actual squid controller box. And so the squid sensors are the part that makes this more difficult. And that's the internal part. And so these superconducting quantum interference device sensors have to be extremely cold in order to operate. We use high sensitivity um, squid sense, high temperature squid sensors that have a lower sensitivity than the ones you find on the rapid. But the flip side to that is they only require liquid nitrogen temperatures instead of liquid helium. And for this design that we have here, we can use between eight and 20 millimeter outer diameter specimens. 10 millimeter is the preferred, but for some applications, 20 millimeters will work. But the main limiting factor, since a lot of paleo intensity studies are done on basalts, is that anything substantially larger than 10 millimeters tends to saturate the squids. The one drawback to these squids is that they operate in the uh, radio frequency, uh, the radio spectrum. And that means that they're very sensitive to any external interference, such as someone having a cell phone, someone being on a computer, people doing building work, police sirens going by. And that's where all the thin aluminum shielding that you can see on the internal and external diagrams um, comes into play. So one of the great things is that we now have preliminary demagnetization data. All these data came um, during the pandemic, basically because it started operating in February. And on the left, we have two example orthogonal plots from two of the 
samples that we've been running. Um, these are from Hawaii. So they are young and real samples, but we gave them laboratory um, TRMs in the down Z direction or in the up Z direction, depending on the exact experiment. And as the orthogonal plots generally have a trend of being downward, but it's not perfect. On the right side, uh, plotting these on equal area plots, the equivalent data from the rapid are extremely good, almost exactly what it should be within the margin of error of just the remagnetization process. With Smarter, the data are a lot more scattered, but the correct answer of an inclination of 90 falls within the alpha 95. So is it a replacement for the rapid? No. Can you get quick estimates from it that seem generally reasonable on average? Yes. So then the next step is, can we get preliminary paleo intensity data? And the answer is maybe. So the protocol used is a stepwise demagnetization in Smarter, followed by an external remagnetization in one of the um, magnetic uh, measurements, uh, thermal demagnetizing systems that I showed previously. And then a second stepwise demagnetization. These diagrams that I show here are meant to look similar to Arai plots, but they are not the same. Um, plotted here are the um, relative magnetization of the first attempt at where it was supposed to be a 40 microtesla lab field, then a 60 microtesla lab field. And from the slopes, we can see that there are estimates that are in the high 50s, which is pretty good, considering we are trying to pull out 60. But the R squared values are relatively poor. Um, and because of that, I doubt these data would really pass any type of selection criteria, nor would they would most um, arrive plot selection criteria really be able to apply correctly to these. So this is still the work in progress that I've been working on um, since everything started reopening. So the question then comes, how did how did we do compared to what we were wanting? We get the 600 degree temperature range thereabouts. We don't get the 700. We have automated measurements. We have believable paleo direction data on average. Maybe we can get paleo intensity data from this to be determined. We do have solid state. There's no measurement while moving. There's measurement before and after. There's movement before and after measurement, but it doesn't require spinning or vibrating the sample while measuring. We do have our squid sensors, and the cost is relatively moderate, um, unless you include the cost of my international tuition here in the UK, in which case it probably costs more than a rapid. And so in summary, Smarter lives. You can get the 30-minute demagnetization that we wanted. Paleo intensity is still in the works. It is ideal for pilot studies, but more precision is definitely desired. And as you can see, the design is very prototyped, considering the quad pod is something we just had lying around. And so the design will need finalizing before this really can be taken forward. Thank you for listening. Um, I'll take any questions that you might have. Thank you for the talk. So do we have any, any questions? Yeah, if I, I, I've got a question if I can jump in. So um, I, I have two questions actually. So you talked about directional data. You, you, maybe you said this and maybe I missed it, but 
if you're doing directional data, what size are the samples? Because, you know, the smaller the samples, the harder it is, you know, there's more handling errors in, you know, putting the sample in and stuff in terms of getting directions. So, uh, so the ones that I use are 10 millimeter specimens so that okay. they are sufficient that you can actually orient them, unlike the tiny five millimeter microwave cores mm. that are basically unorientable. Yeah. Um, but these are big enough that you can actually put, for example, a circle on them and orient them. But uh, with some of the more uh, sensitive applications, you would need to use the bigger sizes that are possible with this. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I have another question. So, so you, so for, so this system doesn't. You can't apply a field. So you can't apply a TRM. So like, the, the, I think the Triax system, which is out being advertised outside, and the put. I mean, that can apply a field. So, is, are there any plans to, to, put that option into the instrument so you don't have to take the samples and you know induce a TRM or something elsewhere? So there is currently um, a way, in fact, to apply a field in it. Okay. Um, the current data do not take advantage of this because um, I tested it back in March before everything shut down. And the oven design that's used um, takes advantage of the actual helical design of the oven. And part of the advantage of being in lab is I can show you things. So this is an old oven that, as you can tell, is not coiled very well. But inside the oven is a counter-coiled wire. So the oven itself is non-magnetic because it cancels itself out. But we determined we can actually run a field along this helix, which itself is not counter-coiled. And we can get a applied field um, in the oven space precisely, but not near the squid. So, so in the future, it might be possible to do all the all the in, the really intense experiments entirely inside the instrument. Is that yes? That's the hope. That's the hope. Okay. Good.